introduce me. I was going to play that clip very quickly. This tedious bits of journalistic shorthand is to talk about shockwaves rippling around the world. Well, we're going to hear now about a shockwave that's ripped through the cosmos and may lead to a fresh understanding of how the universe functions. Scientists are very excited uh, about the detection of the biggest merger yet between two black holes. How big? Well, big enough for the signal to travel for seven billion years before it rattled laser detectors in the US and Italy last year. And as for black holes, here's a quick reminder. Black holes are formed by the collapse of massive stars when they have exhausted their nuclear fuel. can no longer support themselves against their own gravity. They are quite literally holes in space that stuff can fall into, but not get out of. They are places where the gravitational field is so strong that nothing, not even light, can get away. The unmistakable voice of uh, Stephen Hawking speaking uh, as part of a BBC documentary in 2018. Karan Jani is one of the lead authors of the scientific paper published today, which gave us details of this discovery. He's an astrophysicist at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. We detected a collision of two black holes in the universe when the uh, universe was just about half its current age, so from really, really far away. It created a black hole, which is the most massive and the most unknown type of black hole we had ever seen. It completely puzzles us. Why does it completely puzzle you? I'm not going to show the whole interview, but uh, the, to me there has been this humbling connection that I would not have been doing physics if I had not come across The Brief History of Time book by Stephen Hawking. And uh, when we did make the discovery of gravitational waves, we were, the team was awarded, and myself was the special breakthrough prize in physics. And that was awarded by the previous recipient of that prize, which was Sir Stephen Hawking. And uh, to sort of feel that we are able to continue the legacy of you know, finding black holes, finding the legacy of such a great man, is definitely one of the things that, that I'm very aware of that legacy. Now, I've already given to you what we are doing now. I'm going to give you a quick snapshot of what the next 20 years of my field are going to look like. So now that we know gravitational waves exist, our next step is to build a gravitational wave observatory in the space, something that I and my colleagues at Vanderbilt are very much involved with. And the process is the same, that we want to build a large interferometer in sky. So we are expected to launch in 2034. It is a European Space Agency mission, which would be launching three satellites in space. And that three satellites by itself would make what you would call a giant LIGO in space. The mission is actually called LISA, stands for Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. It's a handful of words. But what you can see is instead of L shape, we have a triangle. The triangle geometry is because you know, it's easier to maintain that in the space versus you know, making an L shape. The size of this instrument is so grand that nothing that we have as a humanity created as a machine is bigger than what going to be the laser interferometer space antenna. Here is sun in comparison to the detector. So you can get a scale of how big are we talking about big. It is about uh, two and a half million kilometer distance. The, and it is going to travel uh, Earth behind and it's going to actually go around the sun. Most space telescopes we make either are orbiting the Earth or they are at L2, which is a point connecting, you know, zero gravity. Um, net happens, so not zero gravity, so net cancellation happens um, where the James Webb Space Telescope is. This is what the LISA space mission is going to be. And this is something I'm super excited about uh, in terms of what we can find. Now, beyond that, a pet project that I am being heavily involved is to build a gravitational wave detector just like how we have on Earth, but actually on the moon. And this would not have been happening if NASA was not returning back to the moon after 50 years. In fact, when the last time NASA did go to the moon, the astronauts with, carried with them a gravity meter 
which was supposed to be a sort of a primitive version of a gravitational wave detector. Too bad the instrument did not work. And then we used that as a seismometer to know whether we can actually get gravitational waves from the moon. But the moon happens to be one of the best places in solar system where we can conduct a gravitational wave observatory. And I'm happy to chat about that uh, later as well. The future of gravitational waves is just the way the future of electromagnetic astronomy was. You know, we had Galileo make a visible light telescope. After that, we made bigger telescopes to capture more light. Then we realized that, well, we can also make X-ray telescopes. We can make infrared telescopes. We can make UV telescopes. But they all are fundamentally electromagnetic <coughs> waves that we are trying to find. It's a spectrum that we look at the universe. The same way, right now, LIGO detects gravitational waves that are generally of the size of milliseconds. Space missions would start looking at gravitational waves with periods of a couple of hours. So these are sounds that would be stretching a couple of seconds to a couple of hours, right? This is how you can perceive them. Eventually, moon will be somewhere in between. And then we have plans all the way to go to find the very sound that was created when the universe was born. You see cosmic microwave background, but that happens a couple of hundred thousand years after the universe was born. So we lose certain information. But gravitational waves was there in the universe as soon as the universe was born, because gravitational waves is space and time. And anything that is born has space and time, because it's progressing. So we get to hear the very sounds of the early universe. Last minute, I'm just going to say, because I do get this asked in public lectures often. This is all pretty cool. Gravitational waves is considered the greatest scientific discovery of the century. It is absolutely in the same level as landing on the moon in terms of how it impacts human uh, as a sort of a scale of what humanity has achieved. But how does it help day to day? It's a very tricky question. But Einstein did not create general theory of relativity so that we can drive from here to restaurant and know exactly the direction of it. The GPS technology that actually helps us you know, navigate pretty much functioning humans, day-to-day -day modern humans require GPS, is the only direct applications of Einstein's general theory of relativity. Because the very watch that the satellite has and the watch that you have tick in a very different way. And it's hard to know, you know, I mean, a hundred years ago for Einstein, you know, the theory had its application. In the same way, it is hard to know if gravitational waves, you know, hundred years down the line, how it is going to help help human human race. But one way I do think is that if we are going to become a space-faring civilization, then just using Newton's laws of physics is not enough. No matter how you construct a satellite, no matter how big a rocket that Musk would build, it is not going to leave solar system. We do not have an understanding of how space and time actually interacts with us just based on this almost now primitive understanding of gravity that we use to build rockets, etc. And while I'm not a fan of time travel and wormholes and time reps, etc., I do think that our understanding of actually as a human race leaving our solar system very fundamentally relies on finding a theory beyond Einstein's general theory of relativity. Einstein's theory is the most successful human expression mathematically that nature obeys so far. Other than that in quantum mechanics, we don't know anything that human brain has come up with that the nature is in so much agreement with. However, we do know Einstein's theory cannot fully explain black holes. At the heart of black holes are singularity where all known laws of physics break down. And that's not a comfortable truth to live with, especially as a scientist who's studying black holes. So the hope is that maybe not now, a couple of hundred years, just like how Einstein came and came with the GPS, in a hundred years, gravitational waves would have a direct impact on how we live. So on that note, thank you.
are there are there questions? And I'll run over to you with the microphone so everybody can hear it. So how do these gravitational wave observatories achieve the kind of precision that you need to detect gravitational waves? If I recall, you mentioned that it was on the order of, I think, four times 10 to the negative 18th meters. Yeah. How would you ever detect that, especially in a four kilometer long tunnel? That's a very good question. Man. We needed a lot of uh, optical techniques to be able to actually keep light bouncing between the two. The thing that we measure is actually not really the change in path length. But if you've heard of uh, interfer like Michelson interferometer, when the two lights meet, and if they have traveled the same distance, lights actually identically cancel in if they are in phase. So the experiment would have a bright fringe or a dark fringe, you know, depending on how you create it. So we look for the change in fringes. So if a dark fringe becomes a bright fringe, we know that something has changed by a certain amount. And that we have improved the precision of how well we can measure the change in fringe. We don't really have a ruler to measure full kilometer change. So I, so I have a lot of questions, and I don't want to uh, monopolize. But uh, your runs 0, 1, 2, and 3 found the collisions of black holes, and then uh, black hole and neutron star, or neutron star, then a black hole and a neutron star. Yes. Am I mistaken in thinking that run four will start sometime next year? Yes, it starts in March 2023. What could you possibly be expecting to see? I